First, I always want to begin by saying I hope everyone's taking really good care of themselves out there. Right now, we're, what we're experiencing, this, these kinds of disruptions, is certainly not normal. And I think it's, we're all learning how to best navigate them. Uh, so I hope that everyone is taking care of their loved ones, the classmates, and your colleagues. And I also want to uh, just share and thank and acknowledge all of the frontline workers, including our healthcare workers and people on the front lines who've been doing so much work, as well as those people behind the scenes, including those people who help to clean the hospitals, serve the food, delivery workers, grocery store workers, etc. Thank you so much for all that you're doing um, and have done during these uh, during these certainly challenging times. Also like to take a moment to honor all of those who've come before us, our ancestors, all of the lives that have been lost, not only during this pandemic, but those have been lost to um, uh, in terms of uh, getting access for the right for so many of us to vote. I also want to honor those whose lives have been lost in most recent acts of violence and particularly acts of violence and racism. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge the lands upon which we sit and occupy and honor the indigenous peoples whose land um, it, it is. So if we could take just 10 seconds um, for moments of reflection and silence. Thank you. Thank you again. Tonight's panel is part of our NYU initiatives, the NYU Votes and NYU Women 100. NYU Votes, it was launched in 2018 with the goal of giving every single eligible NYU student the opportunity to cast their ballot. So please join and visit nyu.edu slash nyu hyphen votes for resources and instructions to keep our students and voting community informed of the deadlines and processes for registration and of course for voting. NYU Women 100 is a university-wide effort which situates the year-long commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the U.S. 19th Amendment as a moment to reflect and contextualize this historical centennial within a broader and larger context, in particular a historical context uh, and intersectionality today. The global history of the women's right for gender equality, we here at NYU are celebrating the achievements and the innovations and the paths forged by so many women that are being created now and of course contributed to uh, not only the women's right to vote, but of course women's right to access and other rights, uh, excuse me, access to voting and other rights. We honor women who have historically overlooked and across our global communities, particularly those women of transgender non-binary experiences and women of color who were overlooked in the original 19th Amendment. So you can imagine that I'm thrilled to have been and very much looking forward to the rich discussion today. The current pandemic and social conflict and, race and protests uh, issues of racial violence and, of course, xenophobia bring to front, forefront the ways in which intersectionality compounds the vulnerability of women of color at this time, certainly here in the U.S. and globally. So tonight we will focus on how Black and Latinx women are using their vital actions, voices, and efforts to transform the future of the, of the U.S. Uh, and our nation's position within our global communities. Women voters may determine this 2020 election. The 2018 elections were dubbed, quote, the year of the woman, end quote. 102 women were elected to the U.S. House of Representatives and 14 to the U.S. Senate. While we celebrate the passage of the 19th Amendment to Constitution, as I've already said, uh, by which some gain access to the right, we are still substantially underrepresented in elective offices. And of course, there have been many initiatives, uh, including funding initiatives to help women uh, get, get access to um, right, uh, political, political, so they can become political candidates. National surveys of women in the United States also reveal that health and gender-based violence, workplace equity, and racial justice are priorities for women across party lines. And we know, obviously, since this pandemic, we've seen the suppression of women's um, 
research. We've also seen um, the women returning to home in some unsafe situations. And so really thinking about the context for women even during this pandemic. Women of color are a diverse and increasingly active voting bloc and are a significant force in American politics. In fact, the Center for American Progress reports, quote, that since 2000, the citizen voting age of women of color has increased by 59%, a gain of more than 13.5 million potential votes. By contrast, um, non-Hispanic uh, non white women voters increased by just 8% during that same time span, an additional 6 million potential voters. In 2018, turnout among women of color voters also surged more than 15% uh, of pointage, excuse me, percent points compared with that of pre previous midterm elections in 2014. Women of color also played a central role in engaging with the mobilizing others to participate. These factors suggest that women of color voters will play a critical role in this election and upcoming elections, particularly with shifting demography, as we know, that's happening globally. Again, while we're experiencing these disparities, xenophobia, anti-Black racism, there's lots of work to be done. Um, I'm vitalized by, the, oh, by this momentum that is happening with, uh, particularly with voters and women of color voters. And of course, if we think about the generational trends, I think we have great possibility and certainly in higher education, we're very interested in those generational trends. Uh, we know that uh, that younger generations uh, really believe in diversity. They are really interested in their they're extremely mobile and extremely active. So we are in an historic voting year, navigating social disparities, and of course, uh, acutely aware of the social action and transformations that are needed. So let's get out there and let's vote. I just have a couple final things to say. Thank you to my amazing team in the Office of Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation, OGI for short. We're thrilled to partner on this program and thank you to all of our partners. The John Bradham Center, the Center for Black Visual Culture and Institute African American Affairs and Federal Hall, Debate Defends Democracy. And of course, I have to thank Ellen Toscano. Ellen, you are a rock star. Your pleasure to work with and thank you for all of the great work you, you do. Uh, did I say thank you to Skirball and Jay? Jay, thank you and to your team. You're amazing. Uh, it's always just a delight. Um, and so thank you so much. And of course, to our panelists, Thank you so much for being here. And now I will turn it over to Betsy Fisher March, to Betsy and Claudia, who will begin the panel discussion and introduce uh, our, our panel of guests. Um, as some of you know, Betsy is an award winning journalist and former TV news executive at NBC's Meet the Press, the longest running television program in history. She is also currently the executive director of Women in Politics Institute at American University and the executive in residence for American University School of Public Affairs, where she teaches courses on political communication. She also teaches media skills for SBA Analytics and Management Institute. Welcome, Betsy. It's so great to have you back. It's always good to see you. And I'll just uh, say Claudia graduated from NYU in 2016 and after graduation she joined the mayor's team as a special assistant and then director of operations to the first lady. She left the mayor's office in November of 2019 to join Elizabeth Warren's pre presidential campaign. She is currently an MPA candidate at the uh, NYU Robert F. Wagner School of Public Service. Thank you for being here again Claudia. It's good to see you again and I turn it off over to these two rock stars to get us started. Thanks again. Thank you, Lisa. It is always great to be with uh, my friends at NYU, and we really appreciate you all doing this panel and everybody for attending. Um, I want to do a um, quick introduction of one of our um, expert panelists, and then uh, Claudia will introduce uh, the other one. Um, and so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Atima Amara, who is uh, also a friend of our Women in Politics Institute at American University and has, has done some programming with us before. So we're thrilled. I'm thrilled to see her here. She is the uh, founder and principal strategist for the aptly named Amara Strategy Group, uh, and, which is devoted to supporting women and communities of color, LGBTQ plus, and other underrepresented communities in politics and advocacy. Um, and before starting her own firm, uh, she worked on the ground in several political campaigns. Um, she is a former candidate for public office herself, which I want to talk to her about. And uh, she has been elected to multiple Democratic Party leadership roles, um, including as the president of the Young Democrats and as a representative of uh, Virginia to the Democratic National Committee. She is a regular writer, speaker, and television guest commenting on gender, race, and its intersection 
intersections with politics and culture, especially around women's leadership. So thank you, Atima, for being here. And I will toss it over to Claudia. Yes, thank you so much, Betsy. Uh, Francella Chida Chinchia is the Vice President of Partnerships at Equus Labs, a research and innovation hub for the Latinx electorate. She's an expert in advocacy strategy and coalition building for progressive causes and issues affecting people of color. We thank you both for joining us today. Um, I'll begin by asking a question about the important battleground states that are up for grabs in November. So Francella, if it's okay, I'll start with you. Um, what power do Latina women have in states like Florida and Nevada? And are the parties tapping into that network as best as possible or are they missing opportunities? Thank you guys um, for this opportunity, for having us here today and just convening such an important conversation. Um, I'm glad we're starting with this question because it's really been the, the drumbeat we've been trying to really scream from the rooftops <laughs> over at Eki's Labs is the power of Latinas and the growth potential um, that there is in the electorate in the Latin because of the Latina community. So um, I want to step back and talk about that broadly, and then we can get into Florida and Nevada uh, more specifically. Uh, so first and foremost, Latinas, when we talk about the Latino vote, one of the first things we always ask is, what's the gender <laughs> breakdown? What's the gender gap? Um, because Latinas, females, and men, they're very different, broad, broad differences. Um, currently, there's been, actually, you can look back to 2000, and you can see that um, while there's been slightly a sort of static growth uh, on GOP support, 2016 was 32, 2012 uh, for men, 2016 was 32% support for the GOP, 2012 was about 33% support for the GOP. Women are down in the single digits um, in support for the GOP. So there's actually been a big change um, and it's, it's a big gap. So we always ask that question in terms of what's the difference between the two. The second thing we see about Latinas is they're a huge cohort um, among, if you look at different um, sort of gender and age cohorts, young Latinas especially are some of the big, are the biggest cohorts um, among the Latinx population in a lot of these key states, including Nevada, Arizona, Colorado. So it's a big group that we have here as a potential. And then the last thing we know is non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black women actually turn out to vote at greater numbers than Latinas. So in 2016, we had 50% um, of uh, eligible, voting eligible women, Latinas, turn out. But for a non-Hispanic Black, it was closer to 64, non-Hispanic White, closer to 67. So a big 15 point gap. And that's been consistent um, as far back as 2004 that we were looking at. So big group, actually different ideologically from the men and huge growth potential in terms of voting eligible women not coming out to vote. So let, that brings us to some of the sing, sing states, Nevada and Florida. Um, I recommend all the students that are on and everyone else who's on to check out our Medium page, uh, Medium at Equis Research. We actually really try to um, nail down and do explainers on some of our research. We have tons of research on our website as well, but the Medium page is the best place I think to go and, and really like get a sense of it in sort of conversational tone about what we're doing. Um, right now, we just released, I think last week, some vote simulations. Nevada and Florida are two of those. They're not projections, they're simulations. And what that means is we looked at sort of static um, understanding of where the white vote might be um, this, this year, and looking at previous patterns historically, looking at 2018, 2012, and getting a sense of where the white vote might be to then see what difference the Latino vote needs to make in those particular states. In Nevada, um, where we are today, you know, is that the Latino vote, because it's such a large cohort, of course, in Nevada is, is critical. It's critical to the, um, to the white vote. So say we have the white vote at about 43% um, for Biden, for example, you know, nonpartisan, so for example, for Biden, um, we would see that uh, today with the level of support that Latinos have for Biden in this case, for example, um, Biden would actually win. But if it drops down at all from the, the 2012 level of 43% that Biden had actually, that Obama had, then the Latino support makes it, is the game changer, right? So if the white vote changes just at all, 
you need to actually turn out the Latino support um, in higher numbers and in actually uh, in their support for Biden because they could actually flip the result. Um, so that's how, that's how close it is in a place like Nevada. In a place like Florida, for example, where the white vote is today um, and where they have been throughout the summer, you actually, uh, regardless of the Latino vote, um, Biden right now has the numbers to win. But we don't ever assume anything about Florida. <laughs> Florida is unpredictable. And when it comes to Latinos in Florida, we know that we're talking about Cubans, we're talking about Puerto Ricans, and we're also talking about actually 43% of the Latino vote of the Latino population in Florida is neither Cuban nor Puerto Rican. It's Mexican, it's Venezuelan, it's Honduran, it's you know, a huge broad of Latin American voters. And so um, geographically and the things that they care about, you know, it, it's going to be a surprise, as it always is in Florida. So we are very aware that, um, you know, looking at different simulations of where we could be uh, in, you know, in if the, if the different vote, if the white vote regresses to the mean at all, say, for example, uh, a Nelson Gillum number, where, um, you know, the, the Latino vote really was uh, underperforming for Nelson and Gillum, um, you know, we could really have a, a situation in which the Latino vote needs to get up to 60% support. Uh, it could, we could make a huge difference if there's any movement at all um, in that vote. And what we really stress is that we have to have uh, a, a, a strategy to communicate with all of the very different groups and subgroups that we see in a place like Florida. So in that, we stress again, that it's women in which we should spend some time and attention um, because the women are paying attention. The women care about the issues very much. Um, they just have not had enough outreach and time spent to really actually drive that vote, voter turnout, drive that persuasion push. So Franchella, um, can I just follow up on that? I mean, just to that point that you were talking about, what do we know about those kind of messages um, that do really resonate, especially with young Latina women um, and to get them out to the polls? You mentioned that disparity that has existed historically at the voting at lower rates. How do you go about uh, changing that and uh, motivating them to actually uh, to vote? Yeah, you know what people always think about like the Bernie bro and <laughs> like how there was like the sense of like, me, you know, men, love and Bernie. Um, that was a real 2016 thing. Um, this time around, the Latino vote, as you guys might know, there's a whole book that our friend Chuck Rocha wrote about um, called Theo Bernie. The Latino vote really came out for him in, say, Nevada, Colorado, Texas, California. Um, that was driven by young Latinas. That was very much driven by mm -hmm. non-college educated uh, younger Latinas. Huge support for Bernie. Um, that's where that came from him. So it's really, it wasn't really about, um, you know, what we learned now is the messages that he put forth, first of all, they took the time. They took the time to just talk to the community and be in the community. Um, and then second of all, of course, the healthcare messages, of course, the college and the education and messaging, you know, et cetera, the things that already naturally resonate with our community resonated there too. Mm -hmm. So now there's been some sort of, some little of agita thinking, how do we get those Bernie voters to now sort of transfer over to Biden? Right. Are they going to be resistant? You know, or are they worried about that? What we have seen um, overall is actually the same. It's pretty consistent with older Latinas too. Still, still the understanding is there that um, the things that Biden cares about, once it is explained, yeah. uh, the things that Biden cares about still resonate with young Latinas. I have a quick data point on this. We tested some messaging about his bio, mm -hmm. family history, his faith, working up, work, uh, growing up working class. We tested some information about his policies, uh, immigration, and being able to do um, the recovery work that he did after the, you know, the 2004 um, crisis, as well as the Ebola crisis that he managed. We tested that as well, and also tested a direct comparison about him actually listening to some of Bernie's messaging. They all performed really well. Um, over 70% 70, 70 um, of Latinos would always say that, that, like they, that these messages actually made them feel more positive about Biden than they had before, of those who were leading Biden already. And then those who were undecided, 
over 40 to 50 percent of people actually felt more positively after actually hearing these messages he hasn't been defined once you actually tell folks a little bit about him um next gen this research as well they found they were focused on youth as well they found that people really didn't have a lot of understanding and a, you know honestly lower expectations about him and then they are pleasantly surprised um to see that they are aligned you guys might have seen recently, AOC uh, mentions this as well. It's a message that we've tested, that NextGen has tested and we're really pushing. This idea that Biden is listening. Yeah. This idea that he's surrounding himself by um, the experts and the folks, you know, he's part of the Unity Task Force with Bernie. He's part of, you know, AOC's part of his climate task force, et cetera. He's listening, right? He's movable and he's listening. And that's something that um, uh, we've seen that young voters really resonate and understand, like, that's a good thing. We right. Get that. But yet we've sort of pushed on that from the other side with Trump, like for example, in the debate the other night, he was very quick to say, well, I am the Democratic Party, right? And so he's trying, I think, to navigate how far over to more the progressive side he needs to be. And so I think there's this um, definitely push and pull, right, between uh, between the two. And as you mentioned AOC, yeah, she's on board, but you know, how, um, you know, are have they made a conscious decision now just to realize that they have to you know, they, their focus needs to be on, you know, winning the election and then push some of their more progressive policies, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, part of the question was, how, how has the party done a good job? I'm telling you, right. not about the party at all. I'm telling you what we know our independent organizations and others are, are pushing for. We're introducing Biden to them, you know, in a lot of times, in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, you know, and that's, and AOC is doing her, her side of it, like, sort of externally, everyone's kind of doing their thing, trying to, trying to make this happen. But, you know, um, the truth is, we didn't have enough Latinas speak at the DNC, you know? Um, the truth is, we haven't had, you know, that level of Latina leadership in the party to really be elevated, you know, to the extent that, that it deserves. And so who sees mm -hmm. AOC, everybody was mad that she was on for 60 right. seconds. Right. Yeah, <laughs> like who see, we have to see ourselves in the party right. um, and see ourselves elevated in the party as well. And so some of that is, there's room to grow. Um, well, all the last thing I'll say about, about this that I do know is we do a lot of tracking of ads. Yeah. Um, what kind of messaging are, is the party putting out in their ads and Spanish language messaging as well, et cetera. And there's been a huge turnaround in this in the last two weeks, maybe three, probably three weeks where the party really has, and the Biden team really has spent a lot of time and energy and effort um, speaking to the community in Florida, Pennsylvania and Arizona, um, and they're far outspending Trump now. Um, they weren't before, so so that party there. Um, I know that we're not, we're a nonpartisan, so I'll say Trump used to be spending a lot more, and there are organizations um, that spend on his behalf in the Latinx community. Um, and so that definitely exists for sure. Uh, but for, for whatever reason, it's actually a little perplexing. He's pulled back in a lot of places. Um, we think that we don't know what's going on, but he's pulling back his ads and in ways that we're like, huh? Like he's dropping his, I don't know. Um, let me bring Atima in here and ask you specifically, is the Democratic Party doing enough in investing in registering and engaging black women of color, especially in some of these uh, key states? And do you, and what impact also do you think that the, the Kamala, picking Kamala as the, the VP uh, pick has, has helped that at all? Yeah, I think um, I will definitely say in like a lot of conversations I had with a lot of um, political operatives that, um, you know, they were a little worried about sort of the energy on, on the ground. Yeah. Um, Sort of in the in the in the late summer, to sort of and, and everybody was waiting for like, okay, who's the VP pick? We've got a lot of options, and these like four black women were on the list. And we're like, which one's it gonna be? You know, and he really picked the best of both all the kind of worlds you could um, in picking Senator Harris, um, having sort of the statewide executive experience, the U.S. Senate experience, the local experience, um, but also um, very much uh, identifying with her South Asian background, but her black background as well um, was definitely an uptick for the campaign. I think within 48 hours, they raised 48 million online after she was announced as the pick. Um, that was not even counting what was like bought out from the store, right. um, from just like excitement from her being picked and all the, you know, Biden-Harris um, swag being available for purchase. 
And so um, lots of just enthusiastic activists, organizers were like, okay, this gets a lot easier. A lot more people were sort of engaging with the campaign in ways um, that really paid off in sort of in, in, in picking um, her as the candidate. Um, there's been a lot of great organizations that have sprung up certainly in the wake of the 2016 election and pr just prior that are focusing on, you know, black voter turnout, specifically on black women. Um, I would say that the Democratic Party overall certainly has gotten the message since 16 about the importance of the black women vote um, to the point that, you know, now and, and that there are, are um, lots of black men who are like, hey, like, we're a little bit worried about like, we're voting for the president, but like, we or the vice president, but we're a little concerned about our numbers on black men dropping. Um, and, you know, historically, black women in sort of the the numbers when it comes to voting for Democrats have been in the high 90s, right? It's been like maybe on the low end, like 92, 93 to like almost 97%. Um, and, you know, in, in um, to 2016, it was like 94% right. of Black women voted for Hillary Clinton. Um, I was in the 2017 election uh, here in Virginia uh, for the statewide Democratic ticket with the first wave that kind of like led to all the blue wave, Democratic waves that were happening in, in 18, sort of considered the launch of that here, because I live in Virginia, it was about like close to the same number, maybe maybe actually a little bit higher voted for Democrats. Um, so there's always been a consistent pattern that plays out in every election with where black women are. Black women have always, black men have been a little further behind. And they noticed, I think just recently, um, for the six for this for this current election, Trump like in 2016, 8%, he had eight percent of black men under 35. And that number has increased almost to 16%. There's been a lot more of a play um, for Black men as there has been for Latino men. Um, and there's different, you know, uh, different reasonings as to why. Um, I like just generally said like very broadly, it's like patriarchy. <laughs> it's a little bit of what I said, sort of in response because when you look at sort of what they're responding to, it's a little bit of. They said, like, especially with Latino men, if they're from immigrant families that came from countries that had a uh, strong men sort of leaders, mm -hmm. they kind of respond to Trump's sort of braggadocio, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, with Black men, they're playing a lot to his uh, legislation, the First Step Act, whether it's great legislation or not. They're, they're pumping it out online and digital ads about, I did this on criminal justice reform. Um, I'm concerned about this for like economy and jobs that's specifically playing um, to black men. And so um, they've noted that and sort of focus groups that black men kind of remember those because like we're not, you know, folks are not out as much. The digital ads are and texting and all of that is getting more attention than it normally would in this environment. Um, so yeah, I would say it's kind of quite interesting. Um, I feel like um, it's going to be interesting for this election. And I think just a little bit to go back to Francella's point is that our Fitzella's point that you have um, the campaign and I think the party overall shifting to, um, certainly to increase on Latino engagement. Um, and there's been a more concerted effort as the numbers I think are and in Florida and Arizona. And I would say similarly for, for black men as well, since they feel a little bit more comfortable with where they are um, with women of color overall. Right. Um, and, and just a, one quick follow up to there, and then I know Claudia has a question too. Um, those states that you mentioned, the sort of battleground states where Latinas are front and center, I mean, North Carolina is yeah. significant, right, for African Americans? Yeah, you've got basically a lot of the American South. Um, yeah. So you've got like North Carolina, you've got South Carolina, um, Mississippi. Yeah. These are three states that um, are sort of have high black voter populations and um, have very competitive Senate races. I do not think I would be saying that the Senate race in Mississippi is competitive, but there's some polling that has shown he is, um, Mike Espy, um, African-American man whose family is very yeah. politically established in Mississippi, is doing quite well. Um, Jamie Harrison, young black man running in South Carolina, he's like either neck and neck or two points ahead of Lindsey Graham, North Carolina, Cal Cunningham, same uh, Democratic candidate there same deal against Tom Tillis. Um, and black population and voter population is definitely a big 
indicator as to part of why that's happening. Mm -hmm. So only there'll be like suburban white women and all of those, but like black and brown voters are driving up the margins mm -hmm. in those states. Um, and then you're looking at like Michigan, um, uh, definitely for sure. Wisconsin, there's large uh, a black population um, there in some of the key cities and um, suburban areas as well. And, you know, it kind of comes down to what are also the interests for voters right. who are planning to vote for um, the Senate candidates while they're competitive. Um, you know, and if it's, if Biden doesn't do well, he's going to be, if it, for a number, his numbers are lower, the, the better the Senate candidate does, there's not going to be a lot of ticket splitters. And if you're a candidate, if you're interested and you're concerned about COVID and the response, um, if you care about racial justice, if you're caring about healthcare access, you're likely voting for a Democrat. That's how the polling is sort of broken down. Mm -hmm. um, that's certainly a concern for women voters um, because of what they're seeing with their families. Um, and if you're a woman of color, Black, Latina, Asian, you are, are very concerned with how it's the COVID is the access to healthcare is affecting right. your community and combined with sort of the racial justice issues that have been really exposed this year. So yeah, those are some of those states that I'm thinking of where black voters are really going to make the difference. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and I'll add, I know Francella uh, touched on this, but I, I wanted to ask you, Atima, is an issue in this election is that a lot of people, like she was saying, they don't feel like they know who Biden is, right? And, and as a result of that, they are planning on sitting out this election. Um, from your perspective, what is the data saying about that? And, you know, one month from the election almost, you, how do we engage them? So little. Yeah, yeah it's funny. To, it's also like a weird generational thing happening, right? Like he has been around for a good portion of a lot of people's lives, right? <laughs> In public life. Like, I mean, he was just recently the vice president. Right. Um, but some people just have a vague memory of that who just come into voting age, right? So, right. you know, I, yeah, like I remember his presidential run when he ran against Obama uh, uh, in the Democratic primary back in eight. Um, I don't remember the other time he ran for president, but I know a lot of the people that like are older than me do, right? right. And so um, you have a lot of younger voters who their point of reference is sort of like, stuff in the 90s and the early 2000s and they're like oh he was like that nice lovable grandpa who was like number two to Obama and that's kind of it that's kind of what I know um but I do know that um the campaign at least when it comes to digital and trying to reach young people and showing who he was as a person um you know even outside of political life they've been trying to been investing in snapchat um, I don't know if they started doing TikTok ads, but I know they were investing in Snapchat and doing some other like, like platform engagement where young people are. I remember there was like actually putting ads like in gamer um, apps where they had like Biden Harris, like it was an article on Biden Harris uh, signs that were actually in gamer games, um, like as ads essentially. Um, so they've been trying to find creative ways to engage certainly um, with younger voters, but they could certainly always do more. I just read recently they're actually going to try and get to finding creative ways to door knock or lit drop um, right. in some of the key battleground states as well because you know there is a little bit of a deficit of knowing who Biden is with uh, Gen Zers um, and much younger millennials so like 30 and under. It should, it should be an interesting you know to see the turnout in those numbers. Uh, yeah. like um, now switching gears a little bit, um, I wanted to ask, so obviously we know and it's important, but black women are literally one of the most powerful voting blocks in the country. And mm -hmm. we saw that power that they have in the primaries. Yeah. How does continued injustice towards black women like Breonna Taylor impact the upcoming elections? And how kind of do we address the fact that they've consistently showed up for us, you know, when it comes to these elections and yet here we are, um, you know, not meeting not being where we need to be as far as justice. Yeah, uh, it's definitely gonna affect uh, engagement. I don't know, I, honestly, and I mean, like, even when I think of like outside of my political circle, like I was just asked right. for by a friend who is organizing uh, women of color who are lower income, like with, through her nonprofit, just do like a kind of voter education event and what's, it, why it's important to, to get organized in the election in the Midwest, like somewhere in the Midwest, she reached out to me to do a virtual event for her. Um, and so black women are very motivated and I think they're, you know, if you're a black woman who's voting, um, 
your, again, the top three issues for you are COVID healthcare and racial justice. And, you know, you are a really concerned, like it was interesting thing I was talking to one black woman candidate, she's running for mayor in her area. And she said, you know, I talked to older black women. She's, you know, I hear them say, this isn't right. I didn't want my grandbabies out in these streets. Like I was protesting, you know, when I was young in the sixties and the fifties, I thought we were, I thought we were set. We were thought we were good. And, um, you know, so they're, they're concerned for like their progeny, like their, 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 their family mm -hmm. in that sense. Um, you know, I was going out to like a protest rally. It was like ride for black lives. And I was doing something there. Even my parents were like, uh, is she okay? Is she taking a mask? Is it socially distant? Like, it's fine. Everything's fine. Like, you know, <laughs> reassuring them. I think that's the mindset of a lot of older black voters as they kind of go into like their sunset years is, is what they're thinking of. I think with younger black people, you know, there's all of the issues of racial justice and like fighting this next leg as the Black Lives Matter generation but also, um, you know, the other issues that are the younger people are dealing with overall, student loans, um, yes. the fact that another, <laughs> right? <laughs> the fact that another generation of, um, you know, folks have to worry about, like there's been, the millennials have been hit by two recessions. Gen Zers just, like, yeah. that was like the thing I was reading is like, you know, the parents who are talking about, oh my God, how am I going to handle like student loans, affording a house that's big enough, for now a family that I got to fit two of us who maybe work with our kids in a house, those are millennial moms and dads, right? The like oldest millennials are almost 40. Hello. And then the younger millennials for like late twenties, early thirties. So 2000, right. So it's like 2008, you get hit hard. And then, you know, you get hit hard again when you fight your, and then we, they, they basically said, you know, for millennials um, that we're probably never really quite economically recover um, because we were, we were underemployed and all of that. So there's all of these things sort of playing into what, and then if you're a black person or a Latino person, you know, you already have the systemic racism where you're not getting paid the same as your white peers. Uh, you're not getting, you're not getting hired as fast. So if it's already a bad economy, and everybody's already underemployed, you know, your underemployment and your employment situation is going to be even more complicated. And so these are all the things, even climate, like that's, that's a big thing um, that younger people are thinking of. These are all the things in their mind when they're going to the polls. Um, so yeah, it gets interesting because I, I was looking at that and how older Black voters are, are what their concerns are and their thoughts are. And then with younger Black voters, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of the same, but additionally complicated by the issues just for millennials and Gen Zers now. Francel, let me just pick up on that. Um, the team mentioned COVID, um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on how that is sort of impacting organizing efforts um, for Latinas and, um, you know, is this an issue that Latina voters are going to be turning out on? Um, since so many, of course, have been ad, you know, adversely affected by this. What are your thoughts on that? So, yes, there's two questions there. The first one is, you know, how important is yeah. the issue of COVID and health and then healthcare, you know, to our to the Latinx community? It's number one, right? It's above the economy, it's above immigration. Um, COVID is number one. Um, healthcare is number one. And, you know, you ask people who they sort of trust and what they want to see, you know, in terms of those recoveries, et cetera. Um, and those are the most sort of the strongest, clearest messages for some people who um, get motivated to vote, right? Just to say, you know, we, we need a candidate we can trust to handle this crisis. Um, schools and access to schools, um, you know, and, and support um, for school uh, families at home who need to deal with you know, all of this that's going on and having the virtual and the technology, you know, all of that is a huge motivator for a lot of next folks too when we look at our polling too, just top, top issues. Um, I think we all know, right, that our communities have been hit really, really hard and um, it has a lot to do with access to healthcare, you know, and they need to, to continue to be essential workers during this time. So we see that very, very plainly. When it comes to the organizing efforts, you know, that's actually my role. I'm actually not the, the researcher on the team. I'm the um, partnerships. Uh, uh, so I work with the organizations on the ground that are trying to communicate with Latinx voters and turn them out. And there has absolutely been a like, well, how do we do field? <laughs> what are we gonna do here? <laughs> and uh, how do we get to the rural areas of Arizona that are full of Latinx people, you know? 
um, Spanish language, you know, and all of that and being able to communicate with people. It's been, it's a challenge. I, I uh, definitely second what I've um, heard a team say a little bit about people doing lit drops and trying to get creative, you know, about how to do it. That's, that is something people are going to try and are going to try for sure. Um, but it makes it makes it so that digital outreach, you know, is obviously all the more important. One of the things that I've been working on is WhatsApp. More than half of the Latinx community is on WhatsApp. WhatsApp was a huge player all over the world in many of the elections we've seen in the last few years in Brazil and in India, huge player, Mexico even. But here in the States, it's more, at least in the Latinx community, it's seen more as a personal like platform for you to talk to your family and friends. There's not a lot of organizing that's done or political messaging that's done sort of in a strategic way, you know, in a really thought, like a really purposeful way. Um, but we have seen just in the last couple of weeks that the disinformation, it's already been flying around, you know, but boy, has it ramped up um, on WhatsApp, huge. Uh, levels of disinformation, it's very difficult to combat on WhatsApp because it's not like you can just take down a post that somebody puts up, right? right. It's, not, it's not like that. So that's something a lot of, I've uh, now trained about 30 organizations on how to use the platform for organizing. How can we leverage the fact that we're already on this platform to communicate with people? Yes, relational organizing is important where it's one-to-one, -one, you're talking to your friends and family, but also can an organization use the platform to just start creating their own groups and their own contact lists on WhatsApp? People are just now exploring this. It's not a um, sort of established uh, piece of the outreach strategy yet. And I think we're, we're experimenting with it now and we're going to see more of it in future elections because we're just now getting, getting going. The last thing I'll say is uh, Walter Mercado's family just partnered with WhatsApp and Vote.org to do some Spanish language outreach, um, especially in Florida, the Miami Herald posted about it. And uh, they have like a Spanish language bot that they're using and they're really trying to get information out to the community. The best way to combat disinformation is not by attacking it head on and discrediting it head on because that just elevates it. The best way is just to put out authentic factual information from trusted messengers mm -hmm. and just flood the internet with that, right. you know, so that we can outdo the, the harm that's been done. And I, um, I think related to that, but also the panel overall in speaking about women, um, Matima, I'll ask you, but what role does confidence play when it comes to women in voting? And I will also add, because we got a, qu a good question from an audience member, but how can we support all women regardless of their political party and engage them in voting um, to ensure, you know, come November 3rd, they show up? confidence plays a big a big role right like and i know like <laughs> a women in politics institute and a lot of other folks have researched and explained like certainly how that lends to like feeling confident enough to run for office like you have all the information and you have all the tools and you have all the education to be just the perfect candidate to run i think women let go of that more so after donald trump got elected um <laughs> but i think you know, it's still sort of like a, we help, we want to be thoughtful. Um, we um, question ourselves more and that goes into the voting process. And so kind of like a funny story for me, uh, that I was sharing with the panelists earlier was that, you know, I'm mom is like, you know, totally a brilliant person, two degrees, like is a nurse, all of these things, understands protocols, memorizes things, amazing, right? You know, she's the one who got her absentee application not quite right and it was and it was rejected and so then she panics she gets it filled out again and then she finally gets her ballot but she's texting with all these questions about the ballot to make sure because she knows her kid works in politics so she can answer her questions ask my dad do you need anything nope i'm good like <laughs> you know that's like a perfect example you know and it's it's, it's like someone this is my mom has like voted for years right and so it's i think it's one of these things where you know making sure the process is explained and it's just not always been easy in this country to vote and it definitely hasn't been for women of color right <laughs> black women have black women black people have a very uh unfortunate violent um turbulent history when it comes to voting rights 
there are, there are constant lawsuits about all of the things that are wrong with, with um, our voting rights laws, you know, not having in-person voting, um, the COVID complicates it, complicates it um, even more, um, you know, how complicated it is to fill out an absentee ballot, um, do you have to have a witness signature? They used to have that in my state. They got rid of that uh, for COVID, thankfully. Um, you know, whether, you know, you have, um, you know, gotten it done at a certain time in a certain way, like all of these sort of additional things, um, you know, going to the ballot and making sure you have an ID when, you know, like in a state like Texas, um, you know, if you don't have a driver's license, then you have to have a passport. And just think of the class layers with that when you think of all the different individuals who in the U.S. I think it's like yeah, how many people have it? Yeah, like ninety percent of Americans don't have a passport because they just haven't traveled abroad for whatever reason. There's a lot of people, and then taking the fact of having a car. And I, granted, it's Texas. A lot of people drive everywhere, but that's like. And it's a lot of assumptions of some people who just can't afford a car. Um, and so not even a state ID, like just something that you get through health and human services. So if you're a homeless person, um, if you're a student who lives out of like state and is in state, like all of these like additional barriers. So there's a lot of layers that make women who are already conscientious and nervous about the process make it even more complicated. And so the, you know, onus is certainly on organizers to make sure you explain the process to anyone, but certainly to women, knowing that very carefully. And with voters of color, when it came to vote by mail, some polling has shown that the more you explain the process, how easy it is, um, that you can do it from the safety of your home, especially in light of COVID, and a lot of states, like in my state, it allows you to track on the website, um, especially making sure that you have prepaid postage. Um, all of that um, kind of drops a lot of agitation about the voting process and, and encourages people of color to trust because uh, the reason why, you know, vote by mail, while it seems very logical and very convenient, there's a lot of distrust because of history there. A lot, lot of people from the Latinx community, particularly Mexican Americans, were denied the rights to vote as well um, in their states. Um, a lot of Asian Americans, similarly. So um, you, have, you have to do extra work there, especially with women, to make sure they feel confident in the process. Okay. Tima, before we take um, a couple more questions I, um, from the audience, I wanted to ask you a, a piece of good news here um, in terms <laughs> of representation. Um, this is, you know, more black women running for office than ever this year. Yeah. Um, you wrote an interesting piece. I just wanted to get um, you to share a little bit about on our gender on the ballot um, project that we do at the Institute with the um, Barbara Lee Family Foundation about this longstanding notion that black candidates couldn't win in districts that weren't majority black, right? Yeah. And obviously that thinking is very limiting, especially for potential black women candidates <laughs> wanting to run. Yeah. Um, and I mentioned in the intro that you had experience running for office. Tell us about that. You ran for the um, General Assembly in Virginia um, yeah. five years ago, 2014. Yeah, um, my goodness. Yeah, so <laughs> six years ago. I would just love for you to share a little bit of, um, of your perspective on that. Yeah. yeah, it was an interesting experience. I was uh, uh, in my earlier 40s at that point. You know, I had been involved in my local party. I was on the board of a local women's health organization. I volunteered at a local shelter. I um, was involved in my civic association. Um, it was a seat that came open um, due to a vacancy because I was taking a job in the new administration, uh, governor's administration that year. And so there was a special trigger. I'm now going to electoral processes. Um, this special was triggered like specifically in July over the course of about a week or two um, in, yeah, in the dead of summer, uh, you know, because they needed to fill the seat. But also it was picked at that specific time because it was a lot more convenient um, for, you know, they were trying to game out which party was going to get like sort of ahead. So it made for the a primary process to be very short um, for both sides and very exhausting. But my experience of having done it was that especially because I looked, I you know, still do, and people tell me I look 
very young. Um, so a lot of folks, when I would stand at like the polls and I'd hand out stuff, and we had like a debate and we had informational events over the course of that very exhausting sort of week and a half was, um, oh, which candidate are you working for? And I'm like, I'm candidate y'all. Um, <laughs> Potter, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm the candidate. You're like, oh, like, you know, so there was that. Um, there was questions about sort of like, you know, my employment and, and what I did. And I was like working part time as like a nonprofit sort of fundraiser. But it was like, you know, these older folks were like, well, you should be established. And, and I was married at that. I had just was married by like a year or two at that point. But they were like, why don't you have kids? Um, you know, you should, you know, worry about. I had one friend, she ran, which is about close in age. And she had run before, just before me, I think earlier that year. And she said, you know, a lot of older women said, had counseled her on, uh, well, you know, uh, you need to like get to a point where like you can, you know, your husband's making enough so that you can run. And she's like, what is, what did I, what does my husband have to do with, you know, lots of sort of just expectations. And then running as a black woman in a district that was predominantly white at that point, pre-2016, a lot of people said, well, you know, um, they thought I did a great job and everything and was like, you know, good going, but, you know, maybe, you know, there are some other districts just right outside that are a lot more racially representative and, you know, you, you being coming from an immigrant family, you, people will respond to that messaging more. And I'm like, why would I move? And that's like a lot of guidance that sometimes mm -hmm. is given to um, candidates. And, you know, sometimes it can be right, sometimes it can be not just based off sort of, you know, your own politics. Like if you're a, you know, a Democrat and you're in a district and it's 80% red and they say, well, move to the district where at least it's competitive, that's, that's probably fair, uh, you know, to suggest, yeah. but just to suggest like, well, yeah, you've done all this community stuff, but really you need to be someplace where there's more black people, there's more brown people. I'm like one, that's just shortchanging the voters, but two, why would I, you know, not run in a district that has, I've made my home where I've, right. I've settled, I own property. And I, community and you know, heard of. Yeah. yeah, people knew who I was, like all of these things, why would, why would I do that? Um, and so it definitely goes back to what we expect and what we sort of thought that here are these districts that are black and brown specific kind of carved out Mm -hmm. And that's your space at the kids' mm -hmm. table. <laughs> and that at first was great because it helped Black and Brown like get like so the representation in Congress that they had long been denied due to Jim Crow and other yeah, 40, discrimination stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Then it became the limit, the yeah. mindset that that's what you do. So then there'd be these long lines of people wanting to run when an African American member of Congress died, being like, okay, you know, there's 20 Parker. people fighting for one yeah. seat when it's like you could be across the country right so that was my experience I think post 2016 yeah a lot more black women candidates have broken past that Lucy McBath in the suburbs of Georgia Lauren Underwood. Her story around gun violence yeah. Lauren Underwood she ran literally in the district she grew up two percent black people mostly white and rural elected youngest black woman in congress so I think we're changing that mindset yeah it's good news <laughs> Claudia do you want to take some audience questions um, sure. Um, how does ageism, and I will let whoever would like to answer this, but how does ageism affect women candidates and combating stereotypes? I think, Atima, you mentioned um, partly, I don't know, Francella, if you would like to, to answer that, but I, I do think it's a, it's like you were just saying, Atima, I think oftentimes age, you know, you're like, are you old enough? You know, do you feel like you have the authority to run? Um, and mm -hmm. I think you know, that becomes something that hinders a lot of people from running. Um, think we, people like AOC, you know, kind of threw that out the window and are paving the way um, for, you know, younger people to kind of say, you know, I see myself in my government and, you know, regardless of my age, I think I have something to say that voters uh, would resonate with. So I don't know who would like to answer that. Mm -hmm. I think so I answer some friends and I talked before if you wanted to go first. <laughs> I mean, you definitely cited a very personal experience with this exact question. <laughs> so I feel like you're probably well suited. The only I have to contribute is probably my favorite moment of the primary was when they were asking the candidates um, about their age and whether they were, you know, Bernie, Elizabeth Warren, and others were going to be the oldest president ever. And she goes, I'll also be the youngest woman president ever. Yes, <laughs> that's, I'm not that. that's perfect framing. Fine. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I think on the thinking about that moment, too, I remember there was lots of 
articles, and I think there was definitely intention in the campaign um, for making sure that Senator Warren was seen as the energetic person that she is. But a lot of people had to be like, oh, she's almost 70? Oh yeah. my gosh, she's like so thin, she's so energetic, she's like on stages, she's standing for hours. And then, you know, there was just lots of comments about, you know, Bernie, like Sanders and Biden looking their age, right? <laughs> and they were like, we're all the same age as her. Um, and so I think it's like, that's how that sort of plays out. But I think it was, a, I, I, you know, from Teleo from having been, you know, in the campaign workings, but I certainly think they played that to their advantage because if she had shown like what people expect of people that age, like some slow down, some low energy, she probably would have been hit a lot harder for that. Yeah. And then conversely, when you're too young, you know, it's, why don't you have kids? Literally, I've had friends who said they, like, if I ever wanted to find a husband, let me run for office. Like, right? Like, if I wanted to find a partner, let me run for office. Because every grandma, auntie, whatever in the district is trying to hook a girl up, right? So, <laughs> But it never happens to their young male or young male colleagues who run right. for office, right? They're just like, oh, yeah, you'll find somebody eventually. But women, like, why aren't you married yet? And then if you're married, I mean, the number of times when I've been out with my husband and I'm thinking, like, okay, well, I got the husband here. Like, so it makes me look like, you know, I like have a wife. They're like, well, when are you having kids? Only people who get to ask me that are my parents and they get yelled at about that. So like, And then you when know. you do have kids, it's the question of, oh, well, how can you run if you have small children? Children, right. 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 It's like, <laughs> like in every single point. It's, point. Yeah. it's just, yeah. never, no, no win for losing. Yeah. 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 Tony Barrett was also facing a lot of uh, sexist questions about how, yeah. how can she have all these children and still do her job so great? You know, like, can yeah. we trust that she can do both? You know, and then... And to Megan's, Megan McCain's credit, she said, um, okay, my dad had like six of us yeah. and nobody asked the question. Right. <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah. Um, so here's a good question to end on um, as our time is coming to an end here. Um, how can we support women regardless of their political view to vote? As we know, certainly all women do not vote the same. Um, so how can we support, you know, women um, no matter what their jersey is, right, to... Um, yeah to get out and vote and participate in politics? To me, this goes back to the original confidence question and I wanted to contribute to that a little bit. Yeah. We know that, I mean, there's this research, Topos Research Partnership has put this out a little bit um, where they're really talking about creating a self-fulfilling prophecy with women and making sure that the message is heard, that their vote is needed and it's necessary and that they're ready. They don't need a PhD to vote. There's this feeling that you need a PhD to vote, and yet if you might have a man who like took AP government, he's gonna like run for office tomorrow. You know, but women are like, I don't know enough about the school board. You know, no, you don't. You know enough. You know about the judges. You know enough by virtue of being you, by virtue of being in you know a sister or a mother, a you know whatever it is that you role that you play in your in your family. With the Latina community, we know that Latinas are highly networked. Um, there's lots of great research done about their presence on social media. Very active on social media. Yeah, you know, big lot of influencers um, are part of the Latino community. At X, we just launched a um, a whole new community called She Se Puede. It's all about Latina uh, empowerment, and it's everything from lifestyle to voting. Um, we've got some great supporters and great celebrity support as well. And the whole point there is to say and really show that this, like you have enough, you need, you know enough, you have enough, you are enough, you are needed, come to the polls, there's a long checklist every day you wake up of the things you have to do every day, put this one, at, you know, it's really important that you put this one at the top. There's not a lack of urgency and there's not a lack of desire. There's, you know, the apathy is not the problem, right? The, the, the problem is that that feeling of, you know, excitement and, you know, will it really matter? Will it really count? And voter suppression, the way it looks today is not the way it used to look. Voter suppression today is about making, you know, throwing fire on everything and making people think that it, it's all a mess and it's not worth your time anyway. And they don't care about you and your vote doesn't matter and they all suck and everything sucks. So stay home, <laughs> you know? So I'm like the, the counter message has to be, you're, you're needed, you know? So that's the self-fulfilling prophecy messaging that we've been definitely helping people push out. Right. Yeah, and I think that there, just to add to them earlier what I said, but I think certainly with Black women voters, there's always been this sort of community engagement. You know, it's, 
you know, when you talk about who to give money to in, in certain countries like in uh, Asia or on the continent of Africa, you're giving it to, to women because they're the ones who are going to feed their families and improve their villages and provide jobs. And it's the same when it comes to voting here in the U.S., especially for Black women and especially for Latino women. You, we, we kind of like, Black women, like the joke is like, okay, we're not just taking like our husband and our kids. We're taking or our partner and our kids. We're taking our whole community. We're taking our church. We're taking like our friends. You know, people always reach out to each other and talk about we have like little phone trees going like it's an effort and that's a, I think it's a very uh, deeply steeped in the country certainly with uh, the black community as to the importance of civic engagement and why that's sort of been passed down generationally and I think still continues but I think it's it's definitely um, that peer-to-peer -peer, especially for women is very very critical in voter engagement. Well, I think that is a good note to end on since our time is coming to an end. But um, I want to thank uh, Tima and Francella and, of course, Claudia for being a part of this discussion. And thank you to NYU for hosting this important conversation this evening. And yeah, 33 days till Election Day. So hope everybody turns out and votes. Uh, vote early if you can. And um, hopefully um, we will um, see you guys sometime soon. And thanks to the audience for joining us. Take care, everybody.